Thank you for joining me. My name is Carrie, and this is the Creative Obsession YouTube channel where I get to talk about all the different things that I get into with my creative uh, explorations. Uh, today is July 25th. It's a Wednesday, 2018. It's going to be a hot one. We've been, we're in a uh, heat wave again here in Oregon. I live near Portland and um, it's hot. It's hot, 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 and I don't mean to complain about the weather, but it affects my creativity, and so it's kind of been sucky. Um, thank you for joining me. Like I said, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. Um, next to the sub where you hit subscribe, there's a little, looks like a little uh, bell. Click on that, and you'll get notifications of when I upload new videos. I try and upload a video every couple of weeks. Uh, this time it's been a little bit longer. Like I said, the weather affects my creativity, and so I haven't felt like I've had a whole lot to share with you uh, until until now. I don't want to come on here and just babble about nothing, so I waited until I actually had a few things to show you. It's pretty light on content, I think, because um, I've just been feeling sort of blah lately. Just sort of like, meh. <laughs> you know, I haven't felt like I wanted to make much of anything and it's weird because I have air conditioning in my house my I have central air so everything's you know feels comfortable in the house um, it just does not make me feel creative when the weather cools like we had a couple of days last week I think that were down into the 70s oh, I just wanted to like make all the things have my windows open and it just all feels really good when it gets hot even though I can be cool inside, I just don't feel like making stuff. So anyway, it's been a little bit of a dry spell, um, but hopefully, hopefully I can get back into it. Uh, you know, about a month ago or so, I did hurt my back and I've been dealing with that. And so some of the stuff I want to do as, as far as like dying and stuff, I haven't been able to do just because of lifting the heavy pots. Um, I probably would be okay to do it now, but... Um, I don't know. I'm just not feeling it. So that's all on hold for right now. I still got yarn in my shop, the creative obsession on Etsy, but there hasn't been anything new put in because I'm just not there. I'm just, I need to, it needs to come naturally to me. I can't force it. So anyway, here I am <laughs> all the words and all, but, um, I do have a few things to show you. And so let's just get on with what I've done. Uh, last episode, I talked to you about the fact that I was going to be making the jelly roll rug. And um, if you follow me on Instagram, which I'm the creative obsession, all one word on Instagram, you've seen my create my finished rug project. So doo -doo -doo -doo. there it is. It's a rainbow. That's half of it. But it looks the same on the other side. <laughs> um, this felt like it took a really long time um, just because of my back situation. I couldn't sit and work on it for too long. And so it was just being done in little spurts of time. And um, so that just felt like it took forever. So I took a jelly roll. This jelly roll I got on Craftsy. It's a Lily and Loom is the brand. And I that may be an Etsy brand. I'm not sure. Or not Etsy. Craftsy brand. Um, I'm not sure that's all the information I have is this little tag. I think it was Market Street or something like that was the colorway name. I got this when, when they were having a pretty good sale. And um, I think it was like a 60% off or something like that. And so I thought, let me try it. Um, I really do like the rug. There it is. So I wanted to kind of talk to you about some things I did a little bit different from the pattern if you do think you're going to make it. Um, when you make your strips, you're putting, you're taking a two and a half inch strip of fabric, and I've got a little example here. So you have your two and a half inch strip of fabric. Then you're putting a piece of batting. Uh, they suggest the same width, two and a half inches. The thing that I did differently is I cut my batting at two and a quarter, which gave me about an eighth of an inch on either side of the batting that to of just fabric. Because when you go to fold it, because you're going to fold it and sew it, that 
just having that little bit of, of less batting when you fold it in if you can picture taking a like a magazine and you roll it and you know how the pages kind of move well that's kind of what's happening when you fold in your fabric here and so by making it an eighth of an inch or I mean a quarter of an inch narrower in the batting when this folds the batting just meets up in the middle and I ended up with less bulk in the center and then when you fold it again and sew it um, I got some really good tips from my friend Lucy who suggested um, sewing the strip with monofilament thread and I liked that idea because I as much as I like to see the thread I didn't want it because I have so many different colors to try you know I wasn't going to change thread color with every time the um, fabric changed colors so what I chose was for this particular project let me scooch some stuff over here for this particular project I chose to do it with a gold uh, thread because gold went with everything it's pretty much in almost every color um, when I did long arm quilting gold went with so many different quilts just because it it just sort of goes with everything and so I picked gold which I think looks fabulous but I didn't also want to have a gold um, stitching line straight stitching line because you stitch it straight and then you zigzag over it so I did monofilament thread in the top and then a bobbin with the gold you can't really run, successfully run monofilament on both the top and the bottom um, in your machine because the monofilament it's like sewing with hair it's super fine you can't really see it but it's slippery and so when the sewing machine the needle goes down and it grabs that bottom bobbin thread you want it to have a little bit of grip and if you just have just two monofilaments it won't give it won't stitch well and um, so here's on the back side you can see can you see where I've got like a gold straight stitch and then I've got the gold zigzag when I put it all together which is fine on the back side I'm, I'm totally fine with that so um, so by making my batting strip a quarter of an inch narrower sewing with the monofilament thread made my entire length of of the jelly roll that I had which was 42 strips I believe I think I got 42 strips and um, so I had talked about how I was joining my strips using some um, inter uh, yeah, interfacing, fusible interfacing. I just cut little strips and I was joining it. And I had a big, huge roll of some that I had done. And something that my friend Lucy suggested, which I don't, what did I do with it? Oh, here, yeah. Is to not bother doing that or sewing it together or anything. What I did, what I ended up doing, and I hope I can show this to you. Let me get it over here. Is I just overlapped the batting like this say this was a whole line and then I got to the end of this and I need to add more batting I just overlapped it just a tiny little bit maybe an eighth of an inch and then went ahead and folded it and sewed it and, you know I, I use these uh, they're called binding clips or, or I think they're called binding clips um, and use those and I would just put a couple on and I'd sew till I got to the end and move the clips down but there you can't really feel it I mean there's a if you press on it you can kind of feel there's a little bit of an overlap but really in the scheme of things you don't notice it so that saved a lot of time that I didn't have to go through and uh, cut those little strips of of uh, interfacing or or uh, God, I can't talk <laughs> cut the, inter the strips of interfacing or press them on I didn't have to do that so I just went along and did it and it's you know it's slow because you're only going like you know six inches and you move a clip and fold it and get it right and then go in you sew a little bit more to the next clip and move it and you're doing that times I wonder how many feet you end up with let me do a quick calculation here you end up with about 1600 feet so you end up with about 1600 feet foot long length of your your you know your fabric basically made into a rope and then and then I started the the spiral going around and around 
Um, one of the things which I really couldn't see how to make it better and really they don't give you any indication in the pattern is your first couple rounds because that corner is really tight. I can't hold it up. I'm having troubles here. There we go. Can you see how that's kind of puckery? You, I can't, you can't avoid that because it's trying to turn and it's stretching the outside of the corner, but it's that inside stuff's got to go somewhere and it just has to bunch up. As you add to it and the curve becomes gentler, it's way easier. Another suggestion my friend Lucy had is, especially when you get out you know, past the center part and it starts to get a little easier to go around the corner, as you're feeding it in, you want to feed it in so that the rope side is on the right. And that way your um, uh, rug is building away from your machine. So you, when it's going through, you kind of want to push the rope just a little bit so that it gives it a little bit more ease when it's coming around the corner. So the first couple of rounds I did steam press it. Like I'd do a couple rounds and I'd take it off the machine and I'd steam press it. And then I'd do a couple more rounds and steam press it. But then I didn't have to do that anymore. Um, once the, the curve got gentler because I was feeding it a little bit faster than the inside curve. I hope that makes sense. It makes it makes a lot of sense when you're actually doing it. And so this lays really flat. So this is this is I put this in my bathroom and then I have I have some of this stuff. It's like um, it's rug grippy. I don't know. I've had it forever. So I don't even know if they sell this stuff anymore. But it's like, um, it's just kind of a grippy rubber stuff. And I just cut it to fit underneath the rug. And so it's in my bathroom. And I love it. And because for one, it's rainbow, but it's it is it's really squishy. Um, it just felt like it took a long time. And, and it wasn't like I was in a hurry. It just that it was a project, it was monotonous, I guess, is more the, the case because you're just sitting there just you know, going round and round and round. Something that helped a lot is using, I use um, my machingers, which is a is a glove. You, these are dirty, I've had these forever. They get, they get kind of yucky. But you can tell on the tips, there's like a little kind of a rubbery... It's not super grippy, but it is grippy. Are these inside out? No. Um, it's not sticky, but it helps you grip. And that helped me kind of force that through because once you start building the rug, then you've got all of this weight and bulk from the rug building up and it just to help you move that around so that your shoulders aren't doing this um, using machine gears gloves. Another thing you can do, um, cause these can be, you know, these are like 10 bucks for these. Is it, if you go to the garden section of your local, you know, I don't know, variety store, <laughs> like here it's Fred Meyer or Kroger, um, <clears throat> they have gloves very similar to this that are garden gloves. So they're just like a polyester type material here and then they've got grippy on the finger. And that, that really helps just to help you, instead of trying to, because otherwise you're trying to push down to get tension to move it, and that alleviates that feeling that you have to do that. So those are just a few of my little tips. Um, so if you decide that you want to make that rug, try that. I found it to, to have really good results when I did that, when I followed that. Um, I've got a fan on, so I'm hoping that the white noise from that isn't too much, but it's warm. And so I need the fan on. Um, I did, I'm slowly worked on some more of my coasters. I've got them all put together and I've just got to top stitch them now, which I've shown in a previous episode. But meanwhile, I have bought a couple more uh, quilt patterns and um, one of them, a friend of mine, when we were away, sorry, I'm going to open this package. When we were away at um, 4th of July, a friend of mine, it was funny, she found, she was scrolling on, I think it was an ad that came up on Instagram or something, and it was, it was a quilt. She's like, oh, this is really cute. This is, I, you know, I want, I want, this is exactly what I would want to have. And I looked at it and it showed kind of like you could go to this site and buy this blanket quilt. And I said, that's, that's like somebody had made that. That's a pattern. So we looked it up, found it. She absolutely loved it. And so I got the pattern. And I'm gonna make that. So it is up north quilt, and that's a better picture. 
of what it's going to look like. So it's trees with this little vintage trailer. So we haven't gotten together yet to um, buy the fabric for it and stuff. And so when I looked through the pattern to just see kind of, could I get away with fat quarters? Do I really need to get yardage? You know, that kind of thing. She's got it to where you're using templates. And I thought, why did you make that so difficult? Because, here, I'll just show you for this example. So here, if you take off that bottom part, that's just a half tri... A, a, you know how you do like half square triangles? I don't know what they call this, but it's... You make a rectangle like this section right here. That's just a rectangle in half. You can cut and sew that without using a template. I was like, why did you make it harder? So I may have to kind of rethink how I'm gonna do this because that's just dumb. It's just dumb to have templates like that. Now, the trailer, I think it should be paper pieced because that would make it way easier. And I don't think she even has it as paper piecing. She's got you cutting the fabric. That would have been an easier thing to make it paper piece. So whoever wrote this pattern made it way more difficult than it needs to be. So it made it kind of like, oh, I don't know what I really got myself into saying I'd make this for her, but I'll try it. So we'll go shopping and we'll get some, some fabric and she wants a little quilt that she can have when she goes camping. So um, I had seen, there's a show through Craftsy, the Midnight Quilt Show with, Angela Walters and Angela Walters is a kind of got her claim to fame through long arming. Um, she kind of started when the whole modern quilt movement kind of started and um, she's very charismatic and got very popular. So she has a show on uh, Craftsy called the Midnight Quilt Show. Sometimes it's a little hard for me to watch because she's um, it doesn't. I don't want to sound awful. I probably should not say anything at all. She's very free with her piecing and stuff and, and not as accurate as I feel like you should be. And that works for her. But she had a show and showed how to make this quilt. And um, it's not her pattern, but she just like demonstrated how you make it. And I just loved it. There was something about it that I just absolutely loved. And I thought, I don't need another quilt. I have plenty. I'm just like, I only use one at a time when I use them. And I have a lot. Nobody really needs them. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just buy the pattern. So at least I have the pattern because down the road sometime, you know, when it's not available anymore, at least I'll have it. Well, then they had, Craftsy had a big, huge summer sale or something. And you could buy the kit at a hugely reduced price. So I thought, oh, gosh, I... I would put it in my cart and I'm like, why? I don't, I don't need this quilt. And then it dawned on me that I have a friend whose daughter will probably get married in the next two to three years. And I thought, it'll make a perfect wedding quilt. So I got it. I love it. It's modern and young and fresh. So you have these big wide stripes of gray and white and then you piece this like fractaled heart. And so I bought the kit. I bought the kit to make a good size quilt. 70 by 81 is a really good size lap, <clears throat> excuse me, lap quilt. It's like almost a twin. Bought the kit for 40 bucks. Like that, you can't buy the fabric for that. <laughs> so this I have, I have the whole kit. It came with the yardage for the gray and the white. And then this two charm packs that make, make uh, the, the heart. And I thought that'll be a really cool wedding gift. And then Jim had the brilliant idea, like when you quilt it, you can quilt script in the stripes. So I could put some little verbiage in there. So she's not engaged, but I have a feeling it's gonna happen soonish, and then I'll be ready. I'll, I'll have a quilt for her, and it'll be, it actually would be perfect for her. So those are some upcoming sewing things. Um, like I had said before, my sewing mojo and my quilting mojo is kind of coming back. And so that's really cool. Um, I have done just a little bit of knitting and really for the amount of time that I haven't, I don't know what I've been doing. My days go by really fast and I feel like I don't have anything to show for it. And that's just pitiful. <laughs> it's just super pitiful. But I have been doing some knitting. I did finish my socks. 
I had shown that I was making these top down with an afterthought heel. And um, last time I talked with you, I was questioning how do I how do I know how to measure the foot length? And so I kind of guessed and and made it and it was too long. So luckily I had a contrasting toe so I knew where to take it out and I took it out about an inch and then just re-knit the toe. And then I knew then I thought, you know what I'm gonna do, and I've seen um, a couple people do this, is they actually count how many rows so that you know when I get to so many rows, that's where I put my heel. And I always thought, well, that's kind of a pain in the butt. But really it wasn't too bad. I just would knit a bunch and then I would count and like every 20 rows I'd put a marker so that it really wasn't that bad. Wrote down the formula so that I could make the matching sock. Um, and when I did the afterthought heel, I picked up the stitches and I knit about six rows, just stockinette before I started the decrease to give me extra here I still feel like they're a little tight and so um, when I did this sock which was toe up after thought heel I've got ribbing I did a three by one rib on the top and it gave me that extra stretch so we were talking about it at knit night and somebody suggested adding stitches like maybe just before I get to where I'm gonna break off for the toe and just like add, you know, six stitches, three on each side type of a thing over a course of several rows and get past where you put the heel in and then go back down and then that might give me the extra here. My only concern with that is is seeing that because you'll see it up on the leg, you'll see it down on the foot, which may not be a problem, um, but if I was doing like truly striped socks, that might mess up how the stripes work because now you've altered um, the stitch count. So another thought I had was as I approached this to just go up a needle size and just make that knit a little bit looser just needle size wise which could still change a, like a true striped uh, patterning I think. I don't know the rest of it fits I mean like it fits around here it fits around here so I don't want to go up stitch count on the overall sock because then I feel like it's going to be too baggy so I don't know I'm trying because I do like the look of of this afterthought heel in a contrasting color on something like this and I do like the fact that putting it in as an afterthought I'm not getting weird pooling the patterning stays the same throughout the whole thing and I, I do like that so I'm trying to kind of rewrite my recipe top down preferably because I do like that and um, just figure out a way to make this part work these are a little snug getting on because of this they may go to my mom although I, I knit it my mom's got shorter feet than me and I knit it to fit me so it'd probably be too long I don't know we'll see maybe if I wear it a little bit it'll stretch out <laughs> So anyway, I finished a pair of socks. I'm almost done with the other sock of this. I'm going toe up and I'm probably about here. So I've got that much more and then that sock will be done, which is pretty good for me. Um, other knitting I have done, I've uh, been making my second worm hat. So this was the first worm hat that I made using a, what is it? Bernat Mandala yarn. And so off of the same ball of yarn, I've got this one. Oh, gosh. You can tell it's been a while. So in here, there's the blue that this left off on. <laughs> and then I just started up again, and it's a, a folded brim. Um, this one I just cast on, and when I got to the point of attaching the brim... I just folded it over and attached it. This one I did a provisional cast on with and to just compare the two. And I think the one with the provisional cast on has a smoother underside. So here's my provisional cast on. This is real smooth. There's no real ridge. You can see the stitches, but it's inside and that's okay, but there's no extra thickness. Where this one, because I 
had just a cast on edge to pick up, there's actually a, a little bit of a ridge. Now this is a real soft yarn, so I don't think it's gonna be a problem, but I think in the future doing the provisional cast on is gonna be the way for me to go, just to avoid having an extra little ridge on your forehead. So I'm gonna go until, I don't know if I'll need this whole thing. Two, three, four, five. I think the pattern says to go for nine or 10 rounds. I'll have to look at it. So I may end up using the rest of this, which would end in a light gray. But you can see where it turned to kind of a super dark navy here. So this would be a good, guy, good guy's hat. That's the inside. Here we go. And with this one, I did the, the brim part um, on a size four and then the hat on a six. And this one I cast on with a six and just kept it as a six the whole way through. So it's gonna be a lot looser, which if it's gonna fit a man or something, you know, there's, I have a big head and so somebody will have a big head and they'll want this. So these are gonna be chemo cap donations. So moving along on that, um, Jim and I had gone last weekend, I guess, when it was like 100 degrees here. And even though we could stay in the house, it was like, if we just sit here, we're just, we're just gonna sit here and watch garbage on TV. Because you can't really go outside and do anything, it's too hot. So we headed out to a little river that we had been wanting to go to, hadn't been in 35, 36 years or something. Like, let's go see if we can find that again. And we just had, it was so perfect. It was the perfect thing to do. Jim's been super busy at work, so it was a good relaxing time. We just brought our chairs, packed up a little like snacky kind of lunch and just sat by the little river. It's pretty low right now because we've been so dry that even our little rivers are pretty low, but it was perfect temperature. It was probably 75 degrees. Just sat by this little, you know, <laughs> little trickly little river. It was more like, looks like more like a creek right now because it's so dry, but we had the best time, the most relaxing time. So I brought that hat and I was knitting on it a little bit and then somehow I goofed up and I, I couldn't figure out how to fix it. Every time I tried to fix it, I felt like I was making it worse, which the hat's only knits and pearls, so I don't really know what I did, but I ended up having to take back several rows and so what I had accomplished, I ended up taking back and I just decided to put it away and just sat there and watched the birds and the trees and it was so nice and we're like we need to come back and do this often unfortunately it takes us like an hour and a half two hours to get there <laughs> but it was nice it was you know if we're gonna just sit around anyway we would much rather be sitting out in the woods along a creek side so um so and then i didn't knit in the car or anything i just like i said i just haven't felt it but i'm hoping it's gonna come back the thing is is it's supposed to be hot like this for a long time we're in the upper 90s close to 100 it's supposed to be over 100 this weekend it's just too hot everything's getting super crispy there's wildfires already and usually wildfire season doesn't start till august and so we're already getting it in july and it's just it kind of sucks anyway enough about the weather i did finish all the parts of my cardigan that i'm making on my knitting machine so I wanted to show you, I made my first button band with like buttonholes and everything. Can you see that? I got a buttonhole. So that was a new technique. I had never done that. There's my buttonhole. I'm going to, this is a folded um, band. And so I'm going to take this purple yarn and just reinforce the holes. I only did four because I never buttoned my sweater all the way down. I'll just kind of button it to hold it closed. Um... So now I've got to make the other button band on the other front. And then um, the way they have you do that is make the other button band and then I'll attach the shoulder seams and then pick up and knit the neckline. And then, um, and then attach the shoulders. And I've already got the sleeves done. So like I said, all the parts are done. There's, it's just ready to kind of do the finishing work. So um, that's pretty good. Another thing I couldn't do for very long just because of the way you have to sit and, and do that and it bothers my back after a while. But I'm happy with it. I was planning on picking it up and hand knitting the button band because I thought I'll just do like a ribbed button band. But because I did the folded bottom band, um, 
I, I felt like it needed a folded button band as well. So th that's what I'm going with. The sleeves do have ribbing, um, but I think it's gonna look pretty cool. I'm really happy with how it's turning out. Um, it's just, you know, work on it little bits at a time till I get it done. Um, something else I picked up, excuse me. Something else I picked up, um, I had somebody donate to me a couple giant garbage bags full of um, yarn that she had at her house because she used to crochet, I think, and just has, doesn't do it anymore. She's like, can somebody at your knit night use this? And I said, sure, I'll take it. You never know. And so I kind of opened it just to see what was in there. And she had a few big giant balls of like baby yarn, like these are big. And I thought, well, I've been wanting to make like a donated or a charity baby blanket. And I thought, you know what? I want to try and do Tunisian crochet. So I'm holding the yarn double. I got a I got a Tunisian crochet hook. It's a it's a wood. I don't know if it's bamboo. Is it bamboo? Yeah, it's bamboo. It's chow goo. And it is a K hook on a 24 inch cord. So the end of your cord has a stopper so that you can can um, stack your stitches on it. So I got going on it and it's really pretty easy. Um, just something different to do. I like the look of the Tunisian crochet stitch. Um, kind of has like a linen look. My concern with this, I'm holding, I'm holding this yarn double, which is there's no label on this yarn, but I think it's just like baby, which is a sport to DK maybe. And I saw somebody, I you know I had to look up on YouTube how to even do the t Tunisian crochet. And there was somebody that um, did it with two strands of baby yarn and used this size hook, which is why I got that. But it, I'm feeling like it's, it might be too stiff. It's real squishy because because of the stitch and the fact that it's, uh, I'm using basically a, th a thick yarn. I think it would probably be, what's heavier than a worsted? Bulky? Chunky? Bulky, I think. It's either worsted or bulky, just based on how this is. But I'm afraid it'll just be like the stiff blanket. It wouldn't be something you'd wrap a baby in. So, I don't know what to do. Because I think if I did it with just one strand, with this size of hook, it's going to be too holy, but maybe that's okay. Because I even thought we'll just take it apart and just make make us just a solid color. Maybe do stripes or something. You know what I might do? is you, So you, you crochet, it's just real interesting the way this works. You crochet a chain and then you do the stitch and you kind of just go back and forth. You don't turn the work. You crochet and keep the, the stitches on the hook and then you take them all off till you get to the end and you have one stitch and then you pick them all back up and then you take them all off. So maybe what I'll do when I get to the end and I just have the one stitch is I'll um, take the hook off, just like leave the loop and then try another. There's I've got two more balls and a white and a variegated in the green and blue. Maybe I'll try it and see with this hook if I just did it with one strand if I like that better. But it's kind of fun. It was just something fun and something different to do that I don't normally do. Um, this would actually make a really nice... If you did this with like cotton... I have an idea. If you did this with like cotton, it would make a really nice rug. Because it's like got a real nice squish like a bath rug and then you can just toss it in the laundry. I might have to try that. Because I wonder if this would work better if it was just um, just worsted weight. Because this might be bigger than, I don't know. My brain's going now. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, um, I don't know what's gonna happen with that. I may just rip it all out and then just give somebody else the yarn and let somebody else figure out what they wanna do with it. But knit night's not till next week, and so it's mine to play with for now. <laughs> um, that's all I have knitting wise. I did want to show you my painting. I, I talked about it last time, I believe, where I got the subscription to Let's Make Art, 
where you, it's a monthly subscription box and you get all the materials you need to do watercolor paintings and do one a week and there's a YouTube video that you can watch that uh, walks you through it and all that so I did the first one which was like a little cactus scene and it was awful <laughs> it was my first time really doing it and I've you know I've done watercolor before but I forgot that you you the part of the process of it is you have to do stuff let it dry if you don't want the colors to bleed because it's, even if it just kind of looks like it's dry but it's not really dry as soon as you put another color right next to it those colors will bleed so it started to get kind of muddy but I thought okay I got the I got the gist of this it wasn't my favorite picture anyway um so I I just like okay put that aside I'm not even going to show you so the next one we did is was this amethyst I thought, okay I can try this so now it's not good but I'm gonna show you because you can't always see all the stuff that turns out right that's my amethyst I mean it's not horrible it's pretty close ish <laughs> um, so there you go that's my amethyst that's not gonna get framed or anything um, I, I just haven't been gravitating towards doing it and so um, I did get August's box I haven't even opened it yet but I did cancel the subscription because I thought I'm not being drawn to it like that I think it would be fun to do just kind of every once in a while but not something where I'm gonna build up all these boxes of supplies great video tutorials great materials that she gives if you're interested in doing any kind of um, watercolor or learning how to do watercolor definitely Go to Let's Make Art, um, check out our YouTube channel. I highly recommend the product. It's just not something I am drawn to right now to want to to, to get into. But it's it'll be fun to just kind of dabble in it a little bit. So the next scene I want to do is, um, we, it's like a sunset, mountain sunset type of scene. And it's done in a circle. So I'm going to do that next. Um, and then there's a an elephant one. I don't even know what's in August's box, but it'll be a surprise. Um, so that's really all the crafting stuff I've done. Um, as far as what's coming up, just kind of more of the same. We were going to go camping this weekend, but with it being over 100, even up at the mountain, it's going to be super hot. And that's just no fun to camp when you're like that. <laughs> so we're going to stay home. Um, so, you know, that's all right. I do did want to go camping, but I don't want to camp when it's that hot. Um, something Jim and I have gotten into, and we've already watched the whole two seasons that are on Netflix, um, is we don't generally watch food shows, and I've never been drawn to food shows because I don't really like to cook. Um, but there's a show, my mom suggested it, and so we started watching it, and we both really liked it, and it's called Somebody Feed Phil. And it's on Netflix and Phil Rosenthal is the host and he was the writer for um, Everybody Loves Raymond. So he's a comedic writer and he goes around to different parts of the world and tries different food and talks about different food. Probably something like the Anthony Bourdain shows, which I never watched, but I think it's the same concept. But it's funny because he comes at it with some humor and um, we really liked it. So it's two seasons on, on Netflix and we watched them all. And then another season we watched that was just started and it's dangerous to watch these and it's called Sugar Rush and it's all just like dessert making. But you watch it and you're just like, I need to have some chocolate or something. <laughs> I need dessert. <laughs> So I got really super inspired and this past weekend I baked some stuff. I had a, a get together to go to that I needed to bring something and so I made a couple things and then um, my son-in-law's birthday I made peanut butter cupcakes with chocolate frosting which were really good. So lots of baking. Um, I can't do that very often because I want to eat it and I might as well just slather it on my body and all the fat places. So I don't do it. But that's what we've been watching. Um, I'm almost finished reading The Night Circus. I think I might have just a chapter or two left. Uh, it takes me a long time because I only read when I go to bed. And I may not even get through a chapter before I start falling asleep and drop my book. <laughs> so it takes a while. But um, I had a little bit of a struggle getting into it at first. I couldn't really couldn't really figure out I don't know because you're it tells you like a timestamp, and I think it's because I don't read a big bulk at the same 
you know, all at once, but it'll say the date. And then it goes to another character and it's another date. And I'm like, is this consecutive? Or so I have to go back, like, you know, <laughs> is this consecutive? Are we going back in time? Is this? So it took me a little while to kind of get the gist of it. It's it's a really good book. It is a really good story. I do want to listen to it on an audiobook because I've heard that um, that it's really good to listen to. And that was suggested by uh, Mary Beth and Helen, who are the Crafty Toads. They're doing a book club type of thing, and that's the book right now for the summer is uh, the Night Circus. So um, I did enjoy it. I'm glad I, I'm glad I read it. So the, I don't know what I have next. Um, Chevis was talking about, she's got the Chevy Roll stuff. Chevy Roll make stuff. I don't know. What's the name of your podcast? <laughs> I don't remember. I just see it come up on my, on my thing and I get super excited. Anyway, she said she, she suggested the book Cinder. And so I looked it up and I, I, I've got that. I'm going to put that hold on that for the library, but that'll be my next one, I think. I'll read something else in between. Um, I wanted to share really quick a purchase that I made. This is from Round Rabbit. Um, Nancy makes really cute things. And she had made this little pouchy bag kind of thing. And she made it so that you could hook it on your belt loops of your pants so you don't have to carry it. Which I thought was a really cute idea. So it's kind of a fanny pack, but not really a fanny pack. And when I saw purple and rainbow... It's like, okay, thanks for making it for me. And I snagged it because she only had one. What I think I'm going to do, though, is I think I'm going to make a longer strap. I hate to because she did this so cool. She kept the dots like right in the middle of the strap, which I love. And I don't have this fabric, but I, I'll grab a purple fabric because I think I want to make it so that it's a crossbody type purse. Um, because it's all I really carry is my phone and like, you know, I rarely have cash, but in my driver's license and a, and a couple cards and that's all I really carry in my purse anyway and I think this would be really good to take with me to Alaska and use every day because it's purple and rainbows <laughs> so check out round rabbit she's on she on Etsy yes I think I got it on Etsy pretty sure I'll look it up and I'll put it on the screen <laughs> because I can't remember but um, I'm really happy I got this because it's it's me so thank you so much for being here and joining me uh, in my little rambles. Um, it felt good to kind of get set up and do this again. And I hope that it's not going to be so long next time. But you know, summer is just weird for me. Um, I just don't feel creative in the summer. I don't know why. I think because of the heat. I don't know. It gets really warm up here where I usually sew and stuff like that. So trying to do stuff in the mornings, trying to stay inspired. But anyway, I hope you all are enjoying your summer and I hope it's not super duper hot where you are because that would suck. But anyway, uh, stay cool. Thanks for joining me and I will see you next time.